So um, again, I'm Kate Younger. I am a pediatric psychologist at Cincinnati Children's. And over the past eight years or so, I have specialized in working with children who have intractable epilepsy. So as we all know, kids who continue to have seizures despite having the best medical um, treatments available to them. So LGS, Dravet, a lot of different types of genetic epilepsies are what I see every day. So I um, was just so impressed with Dr. Call's talk, and um, he really set a high bar. So I hope that I can do this talk justice. And I think that it's actually a really nice talk to come off the heels of his talk, because a lot of what I'm going to be focusing on are the stresses that can happen when you have a child with a medically complex illness, such as LGS, um, and the additional challenges that that puts on us as caregivers. So to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, the first thing that I want to briefly touch on is the importance of a family systems approach. So a lot of times when we have children with epilepsy or other chronic conditions in the pediatric healthcare system, appropriately so, a lot of the focus is on how children are functioning, but we know that children are just one part of that family system and that community system. And so I want to briefly highlight why it's so important that we think about caregivers as part of the overall care for the children that we provide or for the overall care that we provide to children with epilepsy. Um, we will take a little bit of time to do a little roll call for all of the challenges we know that are associated with epilepsy, at least some of them. Um, talk a little bit of time or take a little bit of time to talk about burnout and define medical traumatic stress and that particular type of stress that we're focusing on today. Go over important ways to cope to help build resilience and allow you to manage the stresses that occur day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. And then also talk to you about important red flags and when the, all the good strategies that you're already using don't seem to quite um, have the effect that they need to, when it is important to seek help and what that help might look like. So to start, as I kind of talked about before, when a child has epilepsy, to some extent, every person in that family is impacted by that epilepsy diagnosis. So the child with epilepsy exists within a family. That family um, exists within a community. So then we start to think about the child within the family, the family within the school system and within the faith organization, um, restaurants going around the community, friendships, different people that you're connected to. And then above that, we think about how that community fits into the culture, which can vary from town to town, um, from, you know, based on geography, based on different social factors, based on SES, resources, culture, politics, all of that stuff. And so as psychologists, when we're thinking about how having a diagnosis like epilepsy can impact a child and family, we're really trying to understand the ripples that that diagnosis can have throughout that child's kind of whole life. So when a child is diagnosed with epilepsy, all family members are impacted in different ways. For the child who has the seizures, obviously they are the ones who are experiencing the seizures, who are having to take the medicine, um, go through and endure those different medical procedures, really care for their health. Um, they may be the ones who are experiencing those procedures or pain. Um, oops, sorry. Um, potentially having changes in appearance related to medication, side effects, surgeries, so forth. Maybe the ones missing out on activities, so there are certain things that they want to be doing but can't for whatever reason, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And then on the parent side, they're the ones, more of the observers. Um, I say that a little flipply. So they may be the observers in a lot of ways that they're watching their children progress through these different challenges and barriers and successes. That is huge as well. Um, but in their own ways, right, like they're also enduring a lot of different challenges that relate to their child having epilepsy. Um, they have the, you know, difficult experience of seeing their child in pain or seeing their child in um, potentially life-threatening situations. Um, the initial diagnosis and how overwhelming that is. I remember one dad in particular was telling me when his daughter was diagnosed with epilepsy, he was so overwhelmed that he went out to the car and was trying to get in the car and couldn't get in, couldn't get in, and ended up calling protective services to come and help him get in the car. And it turned out he was using the wrong key. 
Um, and it's because just it was such an overwhelming experience to hear these words that really your ability to think through things is really kind of compromised and just how impactful that was. And it's just it's a story that really sticks out to me. Um, certainly, it's associated with a lot of uncertainty over time. And in a lot of ways, parents will describe this, brief, this grieving process or this loss process, both for the life that you may have expected or wanted your child to have, or in the event that children may pass as well. Dr. Junger, if I could stop for a second. Yeah. I think we're still seeing the first slide. You may have paused your share accidentally. Oh. And so we have only been seeing the first slide the whole time. So I just want to make sure you maybe do a new share. Sorry about that. And you've muted yourself, so you have to unmute yourself real quick too. Oh, technology. Um, sorry about that. I think my Zoom was having a harder time. There we go. So we'll make sure you're up and running and on the slide you want to be on real quick here before we go forward. Yeah, sure. Take your time. Are you seeing that? So this is the family system slide that I kind of went over. Let me just take a look here real quick. It's coming up slowly, but it's getting there. Still almost seen. Okay, yes, now we're seeing a family systems approach, okay? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, the other thing that I would just point out is that I am about to talk about more difficult things that um, I would just kind of give a trigger warning to this talk that sometimes parents will tell me even just talking about this and approaching this stuff and really getting into contact with these emotions can feel pretty overwhelming. And so I just want to put it out there that if you are starting to feel overwhelmed or stressed out by this talk, by all means, take a step away, take some deep breaths, go outside for a minute and come back if you are feeling like this information is just a little too triggering for you. It's totally fine. I would also, we're going to talk about some difficult things too. And so some of these slides may be a little bit more geared toward parents. So depending on who their parents and care caregivers. Um, so I'll use those terms interchangeably. But if you have other children or other people listening to the talk, I just want to give a heads up that some of the things that I'm talking about can be um, fairly emotional and difficult. So I just want to let you be able to make that decision about who hears these or who hears this. So um, I do not have to tell any of you that having a child with LG LGS really um, can be associated with a number of caregiving challenges that really extend beyond what um, challenges we typically think of for caregiving of any child. So what research will show is there are many different areas that in and of themselves are uniquely and kind of particularly related to the increased stress that families will report. So first and um, not first and foremost necessarily, but one of the really challenging things about epilepsy is how unpredictable it is. And oftentimes what that means is that seizures can happen for no reason at all. I mean, reasons, but nothing that you can identify in the moment, right? So they can happen anytime, any place, look any different way, and potentially be the seizure that really responds that quick first aid or prolonged seizure that requires that emergency intervention. And it's that unpredictability of when seizures happen and why they happen that can really make it difficult to cope with the um, with having epilepsy as the particular um, medical illness that your child has. Um, a lot of parents will talk about grieving the loss of health, um, and that can happen at different stages. So some children may have a period of early health where they are meeting milestones and they're developing typically, um, and then all of a sudden they start having seizures, and then suddenly kind of that normalcy or the health that the family was experienced feels like it's suddenly taken away. And as parents get used to the diagnosis of epilepsy or seizures, that, that um, that's when they start to experience this grief of the loss of health or the loss of what they thought their child's childhood was going to look like, at least for that period of time. Other parents learn about that much earlier. So during the perinatal period or during the neonatal period, when your baby's really tiny, already um, things are starting to be identified that let you know that there are things about this child's health that may be more of a challenge. We certainly know. Dr. That Jenner, you, I think we might be frozen on your slide again. I hate to interrupt you. Can you just advance your slide real quick and I'll let you know if it's going? 
Because I'm still seeing a family systems approach. Is that what you're supposed to be showing us? Um, nope, there's, a, there's another slide. I'm sorry, I don't know why. No, that's okay. It's possible you might have two versions of PowerPoint running at the same time. You might want to look at that and see. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you on that because we're not... No, I, I'm glad. Hold on one sec. Let me go back to this. Okay, perfect. So you don't have to share then, and we'll, you'll just and you'll see it right there. Okay, do you see that, Dr. Jenger? Uh, I do. Um, is it all right if I try one more time? Sure. With mine, just. Yeah, no problem. And if this doesn't work, then we'll just. Yeah, no worries. This is just. Okay, so I see the, yeah, we see a couple of boxes over that that are blocking it. Oh, and you're muted again, Dr. Dr. Junker, sorry. Uh, do you hear me now? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're unmuted now. Okay, great. Um, so this is such a great time when stress levels are increasing that I get to use some of my own stress management strategies. <laughs> Take some deep breaths. Roll All good. Up. Here we go. All right, let's try this again. If this doesn't work for my computer, then we'll just, it's just easier for me to advance it. I um, totally understand. I, now we haven't seen, now you're not into presentation mode yet. We're still seeing edit mode. Now we're seeing presentation mode. Just advance it once for me. And now that is not advancing. So, um, are you using the are you using the right arrow, left arrow, or how are you doing that when I you're? I am advancing? using the right arrow, left arrow. Okay. Is there a, um? Is there? Can you use the space bar instead? No. Nope. You see, we're still not seeing it. So it, somehow it's freezing it. Does it look like at the top of your screen it says it's in yellow and it says paused? No, it says your screen sharing in green. There's some, there is some disconnect, so it might be better for us just to advance them, and I apologize for that, because we, I don't know if we can get this working. So if you could stop sharing real quick, sure. then we'll give you the feed. Yeah, so this caregiver challenges, if that's okay. Yeah. And they'll follow you, they'll follow you very closely. Uh, just say next slide and you'll be good to go. Okay, cover. that's totally fine. Okay. So, Daniel, we're just seeing, yeah, we don't see your feed back to her yet at this point. No worries. Now we're seeing a splash screen. Now we're seeing the double box. And do you see the double box, Dr. Junger? You do, and now you're muted again, so you have to unmute yourself. You might be hitting that space bar, and I might be doing it accidentally for you. Okay. Um, there you go. And so now you can see it, and uh, you're good to go, okay? So I, let me see if I can blow it up. Now you can pin it. Now if you, if you highlight over it and you pin it, it'll make it easier for you to see. Just go over the three dots. Okay, perfect. Okay, great, okay. go ahead. I can see it better. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, so we, let me see where we left off. So um, grieving the loss of health and then um, the, med the medication regimen. So having a child with epilepsy often means one more loss of AEDs. It could mean things like keto, G-tubes, other treatments, interventions, VNS, any of that stuff that certainly take up a lot of time um, and can create kind of their own stresses associated with administration. If your child has a hard time taking the medicines, I mean, even just remembering to give medicines one, two, three, four times a day, um, all of the different things that you need to support. When you talk about keto, that's really um, quite the burden that's placed on parents in trying to manage that. And so in recognition that all 
all of the things that go along with that medical care, medical appointments, hospitalizations, all of that disruption increases stress. Um, we have the uncertainty about the present and future. So um, certainly in terms of children's health and medical status, but then oftentimes parents will talk about things like their academic progression, their making a, their um, kind of making friends, getting along, doing the things that we want our children and families to be able to do, not only now, but in the future, um, including things like what happens if you have a child who is pretty dependent on you, those long-term um, thoughts that kind of keep you awake at night, what happens to my child when I'm older, after I pass, who's going to take care of my child. Um, certainly a lot of families experience changes in roles when their child is diagnosed with epilepsy. So um, many families will have the experience that one parent or one caregiver actually has to quit their job outside of the home in order to care for the child with epilepsy. Um, and even beyond that, now not only um, you're the parent and caregiver, but you also may be, um, as Dr. Call very nicely pointed out, you may be their behavioral interventionist. You may be their educational advocate. You may be their at-home speech therapist, OT, PT. You're also a caregiver potentially to other children. You may have a partner. You have relationships. You have all of these different role shifts that change. And a lot of parents will talk about how when a child is diagnosed with something like LGS, many of their roles kind of consolidate around their, um, their role as their child's me medical caregiver. So um, another thing that's really stressful can be the stigma that people experience around epilepsy. As common as it is, it's also not something that necessarily a lot of people know about unless you've had the experience of knowing and loving someone who's had epilepsy. A lot of the information that people get about epilepsy is what they may see in the movies, which we know really doesn't apply quite broadly to the population of kids that has epilepsy. Um, stigma can appear in lots of different forms. Um, for children, it could be things like being excluded from field trips or not being invited over to play dates or sleepovers. Um, and parents can talk about similar things as well, that they may hear negative things. Um, they might not be invited to participate in um, in parenting groups or moms groups, those types of things, um, or maybe excluded even from things at work or their own opportunities. Parents, when children are diagnosed with LGS, often um, spend a lot of time information seeking, learning about resources, and advocating for their child. And for better or worse, because LGS is such a rare um, kind of disorder that parents a lot of times have to spend a lot of their time providing education, again, within those spheres in which the children function. Sometimes that can be the extended family or even people in our own nuclear family out to people at school, to other people into the community and so forth. Because of all of these different um, tasks that parents face, we know that they oftentimes have less time to spend in socialization or recreation than other parents do who don't have medically complex kids, as well as spend less time in self-care. Um, things like being able to focus on eating, exercise, relaxation, um, spending time away from your medically fragile child, doing things to balance your life are things that are much more difficult. Um, families face a number of financial stressors, so this can be related um, directly to medical bills, hospitalizations, medic um, you know, medications, all of those types of things, or even things like equipment needs, or you need a van that um, is able to accommodate a wheelchair. Um, and then that is often in the context that I had mentioned earlier that many times there are um, vocational changes among parents whose children have medical needs because there needs to be someone who is home and is able to attend to that child, help that child, as well as be available for all of the ebbs and flows of the disease as it happens. We know that children with epilepsy have a much higher rate of emotional and behavioral comorbidities um, than healthy children. And actually they have higher rates of emotional and behavioral disorders compared to any other chronic medical condition. What I mean by emotion and behavioral disorders are things like anxiety, depression, um, disruptive behavior, ADHD. They also have much higher rates of developmental delays and in intellectual disabilities, um, such that about half of children with epilepsy have a developmental delay of some type. 
Um, finally, um, as a result of some of those comorbidities that children can experience, they often find themselves in a state of prolonged dependence where they are not moving through milestones or becoming as independent in their activities of daily life as many other kids their age and potentially that that dependence on their parents can last for many years, if not forever. Next slide. Thank you. And then I think there are a couple of bullets that will come up as well. So um, oftentimes, as we had talked about before, parents find themselves in the position where they often become the primary medical care caregivers on the day in and day out basis. Um, a lot of families, depending on where they live, um, find themselves in situations where things like home nursing, home supports, those other connections that can help with those caregiving responsibilities are not widely available in their communities. And especially now with COVID, a lot of the supports that families were getting with that really hands-on support has really disappeared or evaporated in a lot of ways in that um, hopefully your experience is, is that it's starting to come back, but certainly one of the things that we hear every day is that families are having a lot more difficulty accessing that in-person support that oftentimes is really super duper important if you have a child who really benefits from that hands-on learning. Um, a lot of the research that we do looking at parents of medical caregivers happens to focus on mothers, or not happens to, but when you look kind of overall at the population of um, caregivers for these children, it is many times the case that mothers are the ones who become the primary caregivers. That being said, it's not being a mother or being a female caregiver that predisposes these caregivers to increase levels of risk or um, the risk of stress and the other things that can happen, but it's simply adopting that role as the primary caregiver that confers the risk. Um, next slide, please. So burnout is really a multidimensional um, concept that can happen when a lot of different things happen. So one, I keep talking about this this idea of roles or role confusion, but the idea is that when parents become primary medical caregivers, one thing that happens is they start to wear many, many, many more hats, a lot of, um, a lot of which really focus around the child and the family, that child or children in the family that are identified as having this medical illness. Um, and that when you are not only a parent, a caregiver, a partner, but also, again, now you're teaching school, you're doing therapies of all different kinds, right? Like you're doing PT, you're doing OT, you're doing speech, you're doing communication, you're doing behavior interventions. Not only that, but you're spending hours upon hours talking to doctors and nurses and health insurance and advocating and claims and all of that stuff. That's an incredible amount of responsibility that obviously can lead to a lot of burnout. It's especially difficult when those caregivers perceive a lack of control. So there's no better time to highlight this than during COVID where families um, may be seeking respite, they may be seeking more support, more hands-on intervention, getting their children back to their more normal routines. And yet, because of all of the different things that have happened right now, they're not able to access those services in the same way, and that is very difficult to cope with. Um, burnout can happen when parents experience unreasonable demands. So one example with this of this would be having sleep disorders is really common in kids who have epilepsy. Um, one thing that can happen is sometimes there's one parent who really becomes the point person for managing these sleep disorders day in and day out, and they're the ones who are up with that child throughout the night for days and days, weeks and weeks, months and months. Um, often so potentially either there's not another option, it's a um, home with one caregiver, and so that person has to be the person waking up, or potentially there's decision making around um, you being the parent at home, so you'll be the one waking up in the middle of the night to help this child while the parent who's working outside of the home is able to get rest. But that's just not a tenable solution if there's kind of any other way around it over time. 
The other thing is um, unrealistic expectations. So an example of this would be, for instance, feeling like you're the only person who can respond in the event that your child has sort of some sort of medical issue. So we'll um, hear from parents who really are not comfortable with anyone else caring for their child because they want to be the one there administering diacet or Versed or whatever it may be. It's certainly understandable, but when, when you are the sole person that you feel comfortable with attending to your child's needs, that's a really, again, exhausting and overwhelming place to be. Um, I certainly will recognize, too, that um, there are other things that can go along with epilepsy, for instance, G-tube feeding or keto or other things that make it much more complicated to care for a child. And so it's very well the case that your kind of choice of people who really are able, either able to manage, willing to learn, or available to really support you on a day-to-day -day basis is quite limited. So it is not to say that there's this choice necessarily that I'm the only one there to respond, that that really is limited by not only your desire to be there to care for your child and you knowing your child best, right? That's true of parents, um, but there really is this limited network to support you. Next slide, please. So now we're going to pivot a little bit to a particular type of stress that often occurs in parents of children who, who are medically fragile or who experience acute or chronic illness that's called medical traumatic stress. And so we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about what that is. Um, if you, yeah, and go ahead, just fill out that slide and I'll just kind of talk through it. So medical traumatic stress um, talks about the psychological, so thinking, mood, behavior, um, changes, as well as physiological responses that can happen. And by physiological responses, we'll get more into that, but that means things like rapid heartbeat, trouble sleeping, kind of feeling jumpy all of the time. And these can happen to children who experience the medically traumatic events or their families or other people who witness this. They happen or they're evoked um, oftentimes in response to something painful, an injury, a serious illness, medical procedures, or invasive or frightening treatment experiences. And um, it may include symptoms of arousal. So that can mean, again, that on edge, I can never settle down. I'm jumping. Like anytime something drops, I'm running in the other room because I'm wondering if my child had a seizure. Um, it can be that re-experiencing. So um, even when everything seems to be pretty calm, you just have these intrusive thoughts going back about the traumatic things that have happened um, or avoidance. So trying to not pay attention to it, not think about it, not feel it, just avoiding trauma triggers, places, people, thoughts, locations, everything that remind you of that um, traumatic event. These symptoms can vary in intensity over time. Um, and interestingly, when you look at the research, it has to do kind of the triggering events for it being um, experienced as traumatic have less so to do with what the actual event was, like objectively, how much danger was your child actually in, and much more to do with your own emotional response to your feeling of how much danger your child was actually in. And that um, in some ways, stress can be adaptive. It's a way that our bodies teach us to learn and pay attention and grow. And oftentimes that's if we can have these periods where we're really able to de-stress and stress just happens in peaks that we respond to. We feel confident about managing the event, whatever it is goes away and then we're back to baseline and stress happens again. Of course, that's oftentimes not what the experience is when you have a child with epilepsy um, where the stress really endures day after day, year after year, is unpredictable and certainly can ebb and flow, but really never goes back down to baseline. And it can start to cause significant disruption in day-to-day -day functioning. I will say that the majority of pediatric patients and their families are resilient and do well. And even if you are experiencing these things or you have experienced these things, certainly building resilience and doing well over time is what we want for all of our families. Next slide, please. So what is traumatic? We know that in day-to-day -day life, we all deal with stress 
And stress is often um, increased by things that are painful or difficult to deal with. And this can be emotionally painful, physically painful, you know, difficult to think through. But essentially, they're events that really increase the tax on your functioning and strain your um, child or your family's ability to cope. What's a little bit different when we talk about trauma is that these types of stresses are defined as extremely frightening or horrifying, life-threatening, that they're sudden, painful, or overwhelming, and that traumatic stress and the associated emotional reactions have these lingering effects that even potentially after that, this specific event that happened is over, continue to cause this disruption in day-to-day -day functioning that lasts over a long period of time and start to cause other problems. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about the array of different ways that traumatic stress shows up. And one of the really interesting things that I will say is it's super common for me to be talking about these things with parents and for parents to say to me, you know, I've experienced these things for days, weeks, months, years, and I just, I never had a word to describe it or a way to understand it. And even just now having words to put around it and a way to understand it and communicate about it is in some ways a little bit healing in and of itself. So one of the ways trauma, trauma shows itself is in terms of re-experiencing. So that means thinking a lot about the different traumatic things that have happened and these the kind of quality of these thoughts is that they're unwanted and intrusive. So for instance, you're sitting at work and you're trying to stay focused and then you are just, you know, being assaulted by thoughts of this really scary thing that happened, or you're trying to fall asleep at night and you just cannot get these thoughts out of your head and they're really distressing and upsetting. Re-experiencing can show up in the form of having nightmares, um, as well as flashbacks. So nightmares happening when we're sleeping, flashbacks can happen when just going about our day-to-day -day activities, all of a sudden you feel like you're there again. So um, it feels like even if it was years ago, it's happening again. You might feel your heart racing. Um, you start sweating. It feels as if you're actually in that situation again, where that fight or flight um, that flight or fight system that we all have is activated again in that moment. In children, you might see it with them demonstrate or acting out elements of the trauma in the play that they're doing. So in listening to kind of your own self-talk or your thoughts or how you might be relaying this to yourself or others, kind of signals that one of these things might be happening are things like, it keeps popping into my mind. It just feels like it's happening all over again. I get upset when something reminds me of it. Next slide, please. Next, we have avoidance. So nobody likes to feel this way, right? Like distress is something that nobody really wants to feel. And as much as we all can, we try to push it away. Um, and to some extent, that can be helpful when we kind of pick and choose when we're confronting things, when we have the ability to do so. But generally speaking, what we know is that trauma will tend to build and build and build and build until you're forced to deal with it. One of the ways I think about this is if you've ever like overeaten on Thanksgiving and it's just stuck in your stomach and you just feel like you can't move and there's nothing you can do to, um, to make the feeling go away other than kind of time passing and digesting. It's kind of the same thing with these traumatic events as they get stuck in our brains and we don't want to do the act of work to get through it because that in itself becomes a painful endeavor. That being said, that is really the way that we help ourselves to process this and to make it more digestible and easier for us to cope with day to day moving forward. So the avoidance symptoms include things like not wanting to talk or think about what happened, avoiding reminders or triggers. So that could be a place where a seizure happened. That could be a certain person. That could be going to the hospital, talking to your medical team. It can be missing or canceling appointments or therapeutic activities. Um, it can be medication non-adherence. So for instance, um, some families will have the experience that giving medicine or doing the um, things that have been prescribed by your medical team in and of themselves become trauma triggers for families and that in order to kind of manage the distress in the moment, they may choose to not do it. Um, and that, that obviously is something that we want to know and address so that you can do the things um, that your team is asking you to do and partner with your team in order to have the best kind of health for your child. 
Um, avoidance can be things like displaying less interest in usual activities, so just not being in very involved, um, feeling no emotionally numb or detached from others, so just not feeling like you can feel anything, just feeling blunted and numb and that you're not necessarily feeling sad or happy or scared or anything, just kind of this existence, which for anyone who has experienced it can be a really unsettling place to be. Um, kind of cues or red flags if you're just kind of going through this in your life and trying to think about it or listening to the other caregivers who you're supporting. It can be things like, I try to block it out. I just try not to think about it. I try to stay away from things that remind me of it. Next slide, please. More symptoms, increased arousal. Again, we keep talking about this physiological, this, the um, stress or the stress system is just you can think of it as a gas pedal on a car. It's just on all the time. Our bodies are de um, developed to kind of cope with stress in small doses. So we get stressed, our bodies activate, our blood pressure increases, our hearts increase, our um, you know breathing increases. We have all this energy to deal with the threat. And then theoretically, you have the chance for that rest and digest to kick in instead. But what can happen when you've had this traumatic stress is that stress system just stays on. And and much like if you drive your car at 80 miles per hour all day, every day, you start going to start to see a lot of wear and tear. The same thing is true when our bodies are on overdrive all the time. Symptoms of this, feeling really irritable or agitated, acting out behavior in adults or kids, um, really, having trouble concentrating or sleeping. Again, this exaggerated startle response where any little thing, you're like jumping out of your seat. Um, being hypervigilant or overprotective, so really feeling like you constantly have to scan the room, you have to look for any sign of danger, that constant checking in on your child to make sure that he or she is okay. I get signals, I'm always afraid something bad will happen, I get jumpy at any loud noise, I can't concentrate, can't sleep, I'm just always waiting for the next shoe to drop or the next crisis to happen. Next slide, please. Negative changes in thoughts or mood. So there are a lot of different ways that this can show up, and you may identify with some of these or other of these at different times. But essentially, um, these talk more about the changes in how we're thinking or our overall mood. So failing to remember important aspects of the event, having negative thoughts about yourself, kind of others in the world, just these persistent negative, things aren't going to work out for me, things aren't going to get better, the world is a bad place, things are unfair, those types of things. Um, having self-blame, experiencing just ongoing anger, shame, fear, sadness, losing interest in the activities that you used to enjoy. And even when you participate in them, either you're not participating in them anymore, or even when you do, you just don't experience that sense of joy that you used to before. Feeling detached from the people around you um, and the inability to experience positive emotions. Again, just your um, ability to kind of feel emotions is really blunted or limited, or even you can feel the negative things, but it's really hard to feel anything positive. So thoughts that might go along with this, I'm unlovable, I'm not sure things will work out, I just don't feel like doing anything anymore. Next slide, please. And then finally, dissociation feelings, which essentially means kind of being disconnected from what's going on. So feeling like in you're in a daze, when you're spacey or zoning out. Um, ways that people might talk about the traumatic events are things like it felt unreal, I felt like I was dreaming, um, having an out-of-body experience, like knowing you were there but feeling like you weren't there, like you were watching something happen. Um, you may start to notice or you may see in your child having new fears or having other somatic, so body complaints that are not explained by a medical condition. So it is not uncommon to see things like headaches, body pain, blood pressure changes, um, you know, stomach upset, discomfort, any sleep disorders, any of those types of things happening. Next slide, please. So what is traumatic for children? Being left alone, being in pain or experiencing painful painful procedures. And again, I'll remind you that these are things that can happen that can be perceived as traumatic, but not every child will perceive it as traumatic. And even if children or adults perceive these things as traumatic, that does not mean the same thing, that you're going to have this traumatic stress reaction. But these are just things to put on your radar, both if you're encountering these in the future, they give you a chance to think through these and plan through these, how you're going to handle and support, or give you a chance to really look through these lists and say, hey, what I'm feeling makes a lot of sense. These are 
different, like check, 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 check. These are a lot of things that my family has experienced. Um, so having a noticeable injury or disability, being exposed to medical equipment that is frightening. We have a lot of kids who have a lot of trouble coping with things like EEGs or MRIs um, or blood draws, right? Like our kids get blood draws on a regular basis and that can be really distressing. Um, having a lot of uncertainty about what will happen next, not knowing when they go into the hospital or when the next seizure happens, that can be very unsettling. Fearing what other kids will think of them, seeing other hurt or sick kids. So sometimes the experience when children are in the hospital can be really difficult for both the child with epilepsy um, and or for their parents. Being exposed as much as having that peer support can be really helpful. It can also be really traumatizing when you're seeing other families go through potentially scary things or potentially things like losing a child. Um, sometimes children will think that the illness or injury is a punishment for something that they did wrong, or they will feel they will um, have a fear of dying. Next slide, please. What's traumatic for parents? Many of the same things. So at the time of a life-threatening injury or diagnosis, the ongoing uncertainty regarding prognosis, certainly in epilepsy, that's something that really rings true for many parents. Having treatment setbacks or relapse. So you have these periods of seizure freedom or making developmental gains. And then you have this period of slide that happens in regression that can be really upsetting. And it's almost like you go through this grieving process again, or it just feels like you work so hard to get there. And then things can crumble for a period of time, and that's really difficult. Um, feeling helpless or guilty when your child is enduring really difficult things, um, fearing your child dying, being exposed to other parents' distress or to the death of other patients, um, seeing your child in pain, going through invasive medical procedures, hooked up to medical equipment and so forth. That list can go on and on, obviously. Next slide, please. So there are important things that we think about in terms of medical events. So things um, that we think about, is it something that happened suddenly or was there a more gradual onset? Um, and kind of looking in the interest of time, um, just kind of running through there, um, this is essentially to say that how, of the, how this all kind of unfolds over time and how supported families feel when they receive this diagnosis during their care, their connection with their medical team, getting their questions answered, feeling confident and secure can all change and influence um, whether families really develop these traumatic um, reactions over time. Next slide, please. More reasons why medical events lead to traumatic, set, um, traumatic stress. Well, for one, they really challenge our beliefs that the world is a safe place. So um, if you kind of had the blessing or um, the privilege kind of before the LGS diagnosis that um, you could kind of count on day to day things being okay and things being generally safe. You have a child have their first seizure or get this diagnosis, and that can really make you step back and question kind of your fundamental belief that everything will be okay. Um, you know, for many people, that sort of kind of lost of this um, trust that things will be okay is often disrupted well before you have a child who has this diagnosis, and that can further um, exacerbate um, those feelings, but that's certainly something where in our own vulnerability or a child's vulnerability is really um, kind of put in our faces that that's a very difficult thing to work through. Um, there can be a real or subjective sense of a life threat. So most seizures end on their own without intervention. Kids are fine um, and they don't lead to any sort of um, real long-term consequences, but Realistically, we know there are some seizures that really threaten our child's health and their um, kind of ability to survive it. And that's a very scary thing. Um, we also, you know, people are being exposed to high tech, intense medical treatments that may be frightening and that the child and parent feel helpless. So um, that can be the EEGs, the MRIs, or certainly when you get to things like considering neurosurgery, VNS, any of that, um, some of the decisions that you're making, or a lot of times kids have epilepsy and. So parents are being asked to make questions about things like G-tubes or other medical interventions or you know all the other medical comorbidities that can happen that are very frightening. Other surgeries, things along those lines. Um, you're seeing your child in pain and any caregiver or parent will tell you that when your child has pain, it can't help but hurt you as well. Um, and being exposed to the injury or the death of others can occur. 
Next slide, please. Um, families are, inquired, are often required to make important decisions at times of great distress um, and that continued exposure can prolong the trauma. So I think about this particularly, you know, differentiating between an event where potentially someone, um, there was a car accident. So this discrete car accident happened. It was terrible um, and very difficult to get through, but it was this it was this one isolated event in some ways is very different than what parents will describe when they have children with epilepsy, which is much more of a complex trauma type of event, meaning that that re-traumatization can happen over and over and over again with changes in medical status, new seizures, new medicines, um, changes in your social support. A lot of parents will talk about during COVID, this isolation in and of itself has been become its own form of trauma and the disconnect from all the teams that were supporting your child and any regressions that you may feel and just this ability that you can't connect to those people who are so important for your support and your child's support. Um, and just that a lot of this re-traumatization can happen day after day, year after year. And a lot of times it's these little things that add up over time. And we know that, um, there's not always an end in sight where we know, you know, for instance, your child gets a cold and we know that there's an end coming. In epilepsy, oftentimes that's not the case. We just, we don't know what this is going to look like 5, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. And that's an awful long time to be thinking about this uncertainty. Next slide, please. So caregivers certainly can experience high levels of toll. It's really after I go through all of that, and I don't mean to just focus on the doom and gloom. I promise we are moving into um, what we can do to help feel better. But I hope that your experience is that, first of all, it's a lot of validation that, wow, like I'm saying a lot of the stuff that you're experiencing um, to give recognition to all of those things that you have overcome and endured and that you work with day to day. But we know that parents have elevated stress. So in epilepsy, 45 to 65 percent of parents will report elevated stress, which means compared to just baseline stress, which is pretty high in this day and age, caregivers of children with epilepsy will report stress levels that are higher, that last longer, and that potentially cause more downstream effects than parents of children who don't have epilepsy. They're often related to child functional status, so it kind of goes without saying, but if you have a child who is um, more medically fragile or just their medical status is not as stable, if they have um, you know, more than one medical comorbidity, if they um, rely on you more for activities of daily living and really just that in and out day-to-day -day care, uh, that increases one's stress. Uh, we know that it's higher when children with epilepsy have the psychosocial comorbidities that we talked about. So anxiety disorders, mood disorders, behavior disorders, learning disorders. And that when you ask parents, actually when you survey parents of kids with epilepsy, they report similar levels to combat soldiers. In terms of PTSD, when we look at kind of all those criteria that I talked about earlier, about 10 to 20% of families um, will report or parents, oftentimes mothers, we talked about the research is often done in mothers, but really the person in the primary caregiving role will report full criteria of symptoms that would um, sometimes describe PTSD. Um, and 40% report some combination of those symptoms that again can cause issues or just difficulties with day-to-day -day functioning and that parents are four times greater risk than the general population for experiencing these symptoms. Next slide, please. These, um, the high levels of stress can um, show up in terms of physical health problems so that they may create more things like pain or illness, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure. Um, some of it can be related to actually the inflammatory changes or just the stress hormones that can be elevated in parents who are caring for these children. Sometimes it's related to that. Um, I am here to say, I don't always engage in healthy coping strategies either. Um, it's hard to all the time, but sometimes having high stress can also be related to things like smoking or having another drink or doing other things that then kind of in and of themselves create risk for other physical health issues as well. Um, and that parents, when you ask them, will report that they have lower quality of life compared to other parents whose child, children do not have chronic medical illnesses. They're at increased risk for difficulties with their own health. So we've already talked some about this, but having more anxiety, worry, that catastrophic thinking, um, having depression, so low mood, kind of lack of motivation, not caring about things, sometimes that suicidal ideation or thoughts. 
and it can change. It can have a big impact on family functioning. So um, you may find that your relationship with your partner has um, not been as great as it used to be, or that the amount of energy that you feel like you can put into your other children is compromised and that you just don't have those relationships or friendships or, um, you know, out in the community that you had um, prior. And it can certainly have an impact on daily role. So when you add all of those other tasks in that we were talking about, some of the basic functions of getting a family from one day to another can become extremely hard. Things like making meals, cooking, getting good sleep, and so forth. Um, we also um, talked about earlier that the financial status of families can be impacted. Next slide, please. Signs of burnout can include withdrawal from loved ones. So just not asking about each other's day anymore, not spending that one-on-one -on -one time, not returning phone calls, kind of um, just being disconnected, or even when you are interacting, just feeling like there isn't this emotional connection anymore. Having a loss of interest in your favorite activities and that even when you do them, it doesn't lead to you feeling better. Having mood changes, so feeling blue, irritable, angry, um, worried, changes in appetite and weight, either direction. So some, some people will report that they're feeling really hungry or that they're eating kind of as a way to cope with all the stress that they're experiencing and may experience weight gain. Other people will report the opposite, that they really have no appetite and they actually might experience weight loss. They may find that they're getting sick more often and they stay sick longer or get sick um, more severely. Um, that they will report just emotional and physical exhaustion. Um, and certainly one of the biggest warning signs that we always want to pay attention to is feelings of want to hurt yourself or feeling like you want to hurt the person that you're taking care of. Um, if that happens, it is important to contact the medical team right away, tell an adult that you trust. Um, and if it's really an emergency, you can always call 911. You can always go to the emergency room for more immediate help while we kind of figure out how to get longer term support in place. Next slide, please. So um, I love the Awkward Yeti. As a psychologist, this is just one of my favorite cartoons, but um, I'll kind of glance over this and not spend time. But this one kind of resonated when I talk about one of the best ways to deal with stress is to try to turn off your brain for just little pieces of time during the day if you can. Next slide, please. So now we're going to kind of move on to self-care. So what can you do? One of the biggest things is to try to be aware of your emotional reactions and distress when um, kind of confronting your own traumatic experiences or other people's traumatic experiences and knowing the things that are likely to increase your stress. So it's kind of taking a step back, being proactive, predicting the times that you will need more support, as well as being very mindful of where your stress level is at any point. A lot of times what happens to all of us is you just push and push and push and push and push and push, and you don't even really notice how stressed you are, out you are until you're blowing up at somebody or you're crying for no apparent reason or you're getting in fights or whatever it may be, when potentially there were opportunities earlier on to take breaks to try to constantly, your stress goes up, you try to bring it down, your stress goes up, you try to bring it down. One of the ways I explain it to kids is if you shake like a Coke bottle and you shake it and shake it and shake it and then take off the top, it's going to explode everywhere. But if you just shake it a little bit and then twist the top and let out some of that air and then tighten again and twist it, uh, let it go and do those releases over time, you can really try to prevent that explosion from happening. And it's very similar to what we talk about in adults as well. Um, connecting with others about talking, um, connecting with colleagues, connecting to spouses, connecting to other people in your community, people who will listen and trying to maintain as much balance as you can between different roles. I'm here to say it is easier said than done. I realize this. That being said, being mindful of how you're spending your time and even writing down what all your roles are and trying to figure out like if you had a pie, kind of how much time to spend in everything. And then you may come to realize there are some pretty small slices of the pie that might be Really related to your well-being. And so coming up with some ways to potentially increase the amount of time that you're spending in those activities that can help um, your overall well-being. Next slide, please. More self-care tips. So in your daily routine, trying to eat sensibly and regularly every day. Again, I'm here to say that is much easier said than done. I am also... Um, 
you know, I also fully recognize, and there's plenty of research to support that, that our bodies are machines. And the more we can set ourselves up for health, it's very much like if you've ever flown with a child, what they will say is if those airbags ever come down, parents put their masks on before they help their children, which is counterintuitive. It's counter instinctual to what any parent wants to do in that sort of situation. But a lot of the things that I'm focusing on is that self-care is so essential to our health and well-being. If we are not healthy and well, it puts us in an impossible situation in terms of care, caring for our children. Um, working to get adequate sleep each night, again, easier said than done, but generally speaking, adults need between seven and eight hours at night. It kind of depends on who you are, but trying to be mindful and carving out that time and really dedicating a space where you're taking care of your sleep and your sleep hygiene as much as you can. Um, being aware of your stress level, as we said, um, trying to really take precautions to exceed your own limits. There are some things that we can't avoid. There are many things that we can't avoid. Um, that being said, if you have any of that ability to have flexibility or even time, like you prioritize your particularly stressed, there are things that are just going to have to wait and giving yourself the permission and the mindfulness to do so can be helpful. Um, and just acknowledging your reactions to stressful circumstances and giving your time, yourself time and space to cope with these. Um, outside of work, um, spending time with family and friends, staying connected, engaging in pleasurable activities, doing things for the sole purpose of mood boosting. That in and of itself is a prescription that as a psychologist, I often write that those, um, those positive opposite activities are really important in getting up and moving. Um, again, being mindful, engaging in rejuvenating activities, so things like meditation, prayer, relaxation. There are all sorts of apps now that exist that you can use just in your home. It sound, I mean, it's so obvious, right? Like anyone could tell you relaxation is really important. Um, and it, right, like it just seems so obvious. And yet it is so incredibly important. Again, when we talk about our nervous system and it being stuck on overdrive, those are opportunities for us to pump the brakes the more we pump the brakes, the better we get at it. And over time, you can reset your neurological system. Um, and then seek therapy if you think that it would be helpful. If you're noticing some of those significant red flags, the things that you're working just aren't doing over time, then that might be a time to kind of think that maybe there's someone else or someone on the more professional side who might be able to support. Next slide, please. More um, kind of tips at work. So trying to diversify, and these are at work, but I would say these are at work or at home. So trying to diversify your tasks. A lot of times what parents will say is when they're at home, a lot of um, these, and I will say it's my own fault for having a different version, slightly different version that I was going to present off my own desktop that I switched it more to home, but um, same sort of things that we're trying to diversify the work that we do. It is really hard to be the medical caregiver all the time. So the extent that you can carve out to be a friend, to be a partner, to be parent to other children, to be if you're crafty, if you're an athlete, if you like playing video games, whatever it is, um, carving out time to have those parts of your identity really be realized again is important for that balance. Taking breaks throughout your workday, whether that's outside of the house or inside of the house, being mindful of that, trying to take vacation days. Again, that can be formally through work or trying to take a break if there are other people who can come in and provide respite so that you get that time away. That's super duper important um, and can really help to sustain you for longer periods of time. Talking with people about how um, this all affects you and seeking out or establishing a support group, kind of recognizing your own limitations. And some of this is getting more into, um, for those parents who are working out of the home, it can be really hard to be showing up at work and trying to pay attention to all of the demands at work when you have all of these things going on at home. And so the ability, if you can carve out those trusted relationships, you let colleagues in or bosses in on what's going on and having that space where people can kind of recognize you as the whole person, again, Again, it's going to vary depending on where you work, but being able to recognize the whole of you, whether you're at work or at home, is really important. Next slide, please. So I am just going to run through this stuff really quick. I don't know if you know about it, but the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has this really fantastic medical traumatic stress toolkit. And what I did was just take a bunch of screen grabs to show you the types of material that are there. But there are resources linked at the end of this talk that you can go explore. So if you just want to 
quickly go through the next slides. If you just keep hitting it, it's going to show you different types of things that you can access. But essentially, there are all of these like step by step um, kind of strategies to cope with different medically stressful situations, whether it's hospitalization, whether it's coming home, taking medicine, talking to people about what's going on, helping your child cope with pain, whatever it may be. There's a whole kind of set of things about what parents can do, as well as a lot of information for children and for healthcare providers. So same thing with this slide. Again, just more screen grabs to show you the type of material that they have. Things about doing exposure. So if you find yourself avoiding a particular activity or playground or whatever it is because of something bad that happened or driving a certain way, um, anxiety and trauma thrives on avoidance. It makes us feel better the fastest, but in avoidance has a way of growing and growing and growing. And what can happen is first you may avoid one playground, then you avoid all playgrounds, and then kind of any place where your child may fall off the have a seizure or whatever it may be. It grows and grows and grows. And suddenly your life has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. The hard part, but the very most effective thing that we can do in really any anxiety disorders to the extent that it's safe is really take those baby steps little by little by little to do the things that make you feel really uncomfortable to the point that you feel masterful over them again um, and that you can then make decisions about where you want to be spending your time, who you're interacting with, what you want to do, but not letting that trauma and anxiety make those decisions for you. Um, next slide, please. So when I talk to parents in clinic, um, I spend a lot of time trying to think about and understand where parents are. Again, this is an incredibly stressful situation um, for everyone, so not just a child with epilepsy, but certainly with parents as well. And we think about the whole child and the whole family, right? Like children cannot be healthy if their parents are not healthy. And so I think it's super important in the pediatric healthcare system that we as pediatric providers still are very mindful about how parents are doing and asking these questions and encouraging parents to bring these things up with us so that even if we're not the people providing this treatment, that we can be aware of it and help you get you connected to the support that you need. So kind of things that I think about is when I'm talking to parents and listening for how long symptoms have been going on, how severe they are, kind of how many different types of symptoms that they're experiencing. And then first and foremost is safety, right? Like everything comes down to being safe. So if I'm hearing that parents are having any thoughts about wanting to hurt themselves or hurt their children, then that's something that obviously isn't it, um, something that I would want to act on immediately. But kind of low mood that lasts one to two weeks, just being down in the dumps and just not being able to get out of it day in and day out. Um, not taking care of your basic needs. So if sleeping, eating, hygiene, hydrating is slipping, that's definitely something that would be more concerning. Um, and then I talked about too, any signs of like um, thinking about the death of yourself or of someone else in more of that active way. Um, again, when we talk about epilepsy, these are kind of intrusive thoughts that can happen, but I'm talking more in terms of wanting to die or thinking about taking steps of how to make that happen. Next slide, please. Um, one type of therapy that is available is called cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's really just a fancy way of saying that our thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and body sensations all kind of go together. Um, oftentimes when people think about therapy, what they want to do is feel better. Like I want to feel happier. I want to feel calmer, but it's really difficult to just feel a different way. And if anyone has told you to just calm down when you're feeling really stressed, you'll know, um, why that does not work. But what we know is if we can really teach people to be mindful of their thoughts and recognize that what comes out of our mouth is what our brains hear and kind of talking through ourselves, talking to ourselves in maybe a more helpful way. It's not to say everything is sunshine and butterflies and that everything has to be good, but potentially there's this kind of dialogue that's going on that's making things more difficult. And that working with someone to kind of give you that perspective can help you see where that self-talk may be something that's making it more difficult and ways to practice kind of thinking through things in a different way. Uh, we focus a lot on different behaviors, so trying to work more toward approach behaviors, so confronting the things that are difficult versus avoidance, or engaging in more of those um, helpful behaviors that can help solve problems, which instead of those behaviors over time, either the avoidance or the unhelp um, unhelpful health behaviors that can um, create more issues or interpersonal problems or whatever it may be, as well as um, teach you ways to calm down, again, 
become the boss of your nervous system, be able to shut things down, um, be very skillful about taking over those physiological reactions. So you don't feel like you just have to be in flight and flight or fight or flight all the time, that it really teaches you to pump the brakes to get that rest and digest, rest and digest effect happening. Um, in combination, so cognitive behavioral therapy is very skill focused and I think is really important and oftentimes in and of itself is really helpful, but some people will find that symptoms are more severe or that um, that didn't get you feeling as good as you wanted it to. And so considering different medicines to help with mood or anxiety may be a really important thing to consider as well. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, otherwise known as CBT, can be delivered by a therapist or a psychologist, um, a social worker, and that's one type of therapy. But even beyond that, finding those supportive people in your communities, whether it's counseling with a pastor or a rabbi or getting that social support, is really important and therapeutic in and of itself, combined with these other professional tools if you feel yourself needing to or that you would benefit from that. And um, to the point of social support, the other thing I would say that's super important is it's not the amount of social support you have, but your perception of how helpful that social support is that really makes the difference in terms of being a really helpful tool for your own health. So if you find yourself in a situation where um, you have people around you, but you still are feeling kind of lonely or these people are not offering or doing things in a way that is super helpful, um, I would encourage for any of those people who may be listening, people who are more in the support role, ask what it is that would be the most th um, the most helpful. So, you know, my what makes me feel better may not be the thing that makes you feel better. And so check in with that person and really offer, like, here are the things that I want to do. And don't ask, like, do you want me to drop off a meal? If you're close enough, just do it. If you can um, do something to make a difference instead of asking that person um, and having them really activate their own network, what I would say is just go ahead and do it. For the people who are listening and who are in the place of um, trying to think about getting the support, it can be really hard for all different reasons, some of which we've talked about, to um, activate that support network. But I really encourage you to reach out and to, although it's exhausting, try to educate the people around you in the support that you need the most. Next slide, please. So here are some resources you are welcome to check out. I think that they're really helpful. Um, and then kind of to wrap it up, today it was the focus um, very much for me was on caring for the caregiver, that taking care of children with epilepsy can be really challenging, but also really extraordinary. And, um, you know, the setbacks can be significant, but the challenges, right, or the um, victories also can be really great. And so these are things um, I hope that just get you thinking about caring for your own health and maybe giving you different words or things to think about in ways that potentially, um, if you find yourself struggling, ideas of what you can do to get yourself feeling better. Next slide, please. And that's it.